你想要分享任何关于 open data 或者是 open government 或者是呃在政府里面的血泪或者是之类的话，呃就可以到报道会台面去分析一下。目前好像已经有两个。好，那呃今天我们的这个主题啊叫做新科技新民主啊，那主要会有两个 talk， 就是一个是。国际的案例，那今天会有 Andrew 来跟我们分享四个不同的国际案例，他们使用一些新科技，然后呃，就是在比如说可能是议会啊，可能是做一些决策啊，用什么样的新方式来做？那那他呃，他之前是在这个，他之前是在这个呃美国的 NDI， 就是民主基金会工作。那那呃，之前全世界有蛮多国家的国，就是国会的监督的团体，他们共同签署了一份这个呃，不要跳太快，签署了一份这个这个协议哦，就是就是呃，应该宣言，就是说我们要怎么样才叫做一个开放的国会？哦，那这个东西的幕后黑手其实就是他。好，那首先呢，这个我们的这个活动通常都会有一个国外的讲者嘛，所以那我通常都会欢迎他来到未来。So Andrew, welcome to the future. Because well, time zone wise, we are in the future. <笑>就是太多次了你不好笑那这就是刚才提到的这个议会开放宣言就是在这个居民地的<笑><笑><笑> 在之前做了一个病后人生的网站之后就红了然后就常常去政府在外演讲后来就被吸收进入政府单位对不对那他负责了一些跟网络上沟通相关的事情那大家可以知道从今年以来政府觉得好像要花一些力气跟所谓的网
。好，那上面你会看到一个网址叫做 GDP A Cafe， 就是你自己拿多少回去可以自己自由捐款。好，好，那所以呃，不免俗，还是要这个认同气氛一下一下，太难笑了。<笑>好。那 OK， 那我现在呃就不占用大家时间，把这个呃麦克风交给 Andrew 好吗？谢谢。OK。好，让我们欢迎 Andrew， 他是从摩洛哥来的，对不对Very much for coming, and thanks to CL very much for the invitation. Uh, it's really fun to be able to meet like new people who are interested in, in this kind of work. And uh, I know that there's a lot of awesome stuff happening here, so um, I look forward to hopefully learning from you guys um, as well. And um, so I'm going to talk a little bit today about citizen engagement in the legislative process. Um, and so to give you a sense of who I am, well, my name is Andrew, and I'm a co-founder of an organization in Morocco called Simpson. Um, and Simpson in Arabic is sesame, and it's a reference to the Alibaba story of open sesame, um, which I think most people so far have known about. Um, and so we say that um, that information is our treasure. Um, so um, we started, well, we were founded about two years ago um, now, and our first project is a, was a platform called Noebo.ma. The web in Arabic means your de in deputies, and the ka sound means yours. So it means your deputies, but it also has a double meaning. It also means sort of like a Facebook for um, deputies. So um, basically, the platform allows citizens to ask questions online. Um, they can ask, they can select their MP, find out more about them, and then they pose their question. And then we help uh, make the process work. So we. Uh, go find their MP if they don't respond by email, and we go track them down, and we get them to respond online. Um, the valuable thing about it is it's all in public. Um, the citizen can, citizens can vote and share online. Here's a sample of what we do. Um, you can see this is a citizen's question. How's, how's your Arabic? Who's got Arabic here? <laughs> no? OK. Um, so the citizen poses their question, and the MP responds. And we have now. Um, enable both citizens and MPs to respond either in writing or by video. Um, so this is actually a, a video of an MP answering the question. Um, one of the other things that we do now is we have um, online like Google Hangouts with MPs. Um, so we do we use YouTube Live um, and we have them come to our office or we do it in different rooms or however they want to do it. Um, and we get citizens to you know, ask questions in advance online. We do a poll to determine the topic. Um, and then we um, have them ask their questions, and we have a moderator who poses the questions to the MP. Um, and they can all you know, participate online um, through commenting and things like that. Um, our project is part of an international um, project called Poplus. Poplus, um, has anybody heard of Poplus? OK, a couple. That's cool. So basically, it's um, a series of, of components um, that have been developed by mostly by um, uh, my society in the UK and um, FCI, which is an organization in Chile. And they basically help you if you want, if you have um, MP, um, if you have uh, parliamentary transcripts. Um, there's an application that helps you, you know, do searching and putting that online. If you have MP profiles, there's another one for that. We're part of, uh, we use Write It, the Write It component, so that helps power our, you know, um, sending questions back and forth between citizens and MPs. Um, so that's what I'm doing right now. Previously, I um, worked at the National Democratic Institute where I helped um, establish a network of organizations around the world that um, focuses on parliaments and parliamentary monitoring and um, these citizen and question things and legislative drafting and all that kind of stuff. Um, and one of the things that we did was help create a Declaration on Parliamentary Openness, which was a message from all of these organizations to their members of Parliament about like what types of information Parliament should make available, 
you know, how they should, you know, develop a culture around openness and um, the format in which, you know, information should be made available. Like, MPs don't know anything about open data. They've never heard of that before. Um, so it was sort of a message to parliaments and to parliamentary staff about, you know, here's our expectations um, and, and, you know, here's what we want you to do about it. Um, so now um, the declaration has been signed by over like 180 organizations in 90 countries and even some parliaments um, have um, endorsed it as well. Um, so now I'm going to get to sort of the meat of what I wanted to talk about today, which is um, engaging citizens online in, in sort of legislative drafting and commenting and things like that. And um, before I do that, I wanted to set forth this um, idea, which is essentially that um, when you're conducting an online activity engaging citizens, there's a relationship between accessibility and the quality of engagement. And what I mean by the quality of engagement is like what type of commenting or input you're going to get. You can have like, you know, comments that are of sentiment, like people saying like, oh, I hate this, you know, I love this, you suck, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, you can have like experience, like people saying, well, you know, through my experience, um, I know that, you know, this is a bad idea. And then you can have actual experts um, um, weighing in. And um, um, there's a relationship. So the more accessible, and it, you know, your initiative is, the more you're likely to get, like, the range of things versus when you narrow it down to things like editing legislation, you're, you're getting less of the sentiment, more of the experience and the expertise. Um, so that's just um, uh, a basic thing I wanted to set for. So I'm going to run through a couple of different um, platforms that I think are interesting um, for various reasons, um, and then I'll sum up with some um, with some thoughts. So the first one is called Parlement Citoyen in, in France, um, and this platform helps you helps MPs actually draft legislation. So um, there's actually six steps to how it works. Um, let me actually look at my notes so I can get them all. The first one is like the MP um, presents a problem. In this case, you can see the video up on the upper left-hand side. This is about restoring confidence um, between uh, citizens and their members of parliament. Um, and so the first step is the MP makes a video presenting like the problem at hand. And then the next step is a consultation. Um, the MP puts forth propositions about sort of the actual problems that this causes, some of the underlying, some of the challenges, and then some potential solutions. And then citizens for 30 days can weigh in on those. They can provide their own problems, challenges, and solutions. Um, and they can vote on all of this. After the 30-day period, um, the organization does a synthesis of like the top ideas. Um, and then they have a debate um, with the MP. They bring together some of the citizens who present, who, whose ideas get the most votes. Um, they bring together some other people who they select. Um, and they have an online discussion about it. Um, the next stage is the MP writes a law. So MPs who participate in this are basically agreeing to ultimately present um, a proposition of law, um, which means it's written by an MP, or in some cases now they're doing it so that they're discussing um, laws that are uh, presented by the government as well. Um, they, um, on this particular um, discussion, they had 779 participants and over like 2,400 contributions and almost 10,000 votes. Um, and they've also, this law wasn't passed, I don't know what the status is of this particular one, but they did recently have a law on pesticide usage um, that was proposed by a senator that has actually been ratified. Um, they also recently started this new um, suggestion box. So, you know, previously it was MPs only who decide what the topic is. So now citizens can, you know, um, propose their own ideas um, and try to get other people to support them and hope that, you know, and try to get an MP to then focus on those subjects. Okay, so the next um, example is from the UK Cabinet Office. And unfortunately, as weird as it might sound, because, you know, parliaments are where legislation is supposed to be drafted, but more often than not, it's it's governments um, that are actually you know developing out new tools, or you know sometimes they're using uh, like IdeaScale and other you know commercial products. 
Um, so in this case, um, the UK Cabinet Office wanted to develop, develop open standards for information and technology um, to facilitate interoperability of systems across the government um, and, both, and public and private sectors as well. Um, for them, it was about a cost issue. Um, the cost of IT for them are too high, and so they wanted to, and they also wanted to level the playing field among contractors um, so that they're getting better deals. So what they did was they set forth um, a, a consultation document, um, and that was sort of the beginning of the discussion. And then they developed a questionnaire um, about this con consultation document. So the questions were basically pretty simple things, like do you agree with the definition of open standard? How does it affect you? How does it affect government? Um, and things of that nature. Um, so here you can see some of the comment, some of the questions, and then you know you can decide whether or not you want to see some of the comments. Um, here's one of the comments. Ultimately, um, they received. I mean, this is a very like bare bones, pretty simple operation here. Um, they received 480 responses in total, um, which they felt was very successful, given that this is a very technical subject. Um, they had a lot of small and medium businesses weighing in, which they hadn't expected at first. Um, they also did a number of, uh, the, the period of, of response was about four months, um, and they actually conducted, conducted six offline consultations in addition to the online um, engagement platform. Um, they, one thing that was key was they partnered with the university, um, which helped um, uh, develop a response document that sort of listed, you know, basically made decision trees about sort of what are some of the, the ideas, you know, the, to, to help analyze um, the, res the responses that they got. Um, and they provided that in full. Um, so they basically discussed sort of like areas where, you know, people agree, areas where there's less agreement, areas where they totally need to rework um, their consultation document. Um, so that's um, a pretty fairly su successful government effort um, along these lines. So the next um, example is from Brazil, um, and the Brazilian government has, or the Brazilian parliament, the, the Chamber of Deputies, the lower house, has been really um, one of the most sort of advanced parliaments, it, well, clearly the most advanced parliament with respect to engaging citizens online. Um, already several years ago, they created a platform called eDemocracia, which you can see at the bottom. Um, and it has a number of features that are aim aimed at helping citizens engage. Um, they have discussion groups, they have, um, that have meetups and things like that, that also interact online. And one of the tools that they have is called the Wiki Legis, which is a wiki, essentially, um, that helps citizens participate um, in editing and uh, in drafting legislation. So they, um, Brazil, about a year ago, um, created in the Chamber of Deputies uh, what's called the Hacker Lab. Um, and so they've invited um, like hackers to basically help them um, start um, redeveloping um, their, their platforms um, and, and rethinking their projects. And so they've just started to redesign um, the platform. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk about some of the things they've done previously because I think there's some value to them. And, um, and we'll see how they redo them. So one thing I wanted to point out is that they have, um, they show you, in addition to just providing you the legislation that they're working on, they provide, um, they tell you what phase the legislation is in, in the legislative process, um, so where they are in the discussions. Um, they also provide um, a number of um, links to sort of debates that have happened about the subject. Um, and other, they also provide links to sort of documents that have helped um, frame the discussions. Um, so all of that is very crucial. You can see that at the bottom here um, to, to a good online discussion, I think. This is what the actual platform looked like. It's now a little bit different, but similar idea. Um, you have on the left-hand side, you know, the different sections of the law. Here you have you know, the part that you're looking at, and then you can either um, propose your own edit to the law, or you can propose, or you can just provide a comment. 
Um, previously, they were also, and this is one of the reasons I didn't show what they're doing now, because um, they, they were actually showing um, what the edits look like in the entire law, um, so version tracking. Um, now they're not doing that yet, but I, I'm pretty sure they're gonna start doing that soon. Um, but version tracking is, is crucial because otherwise it's really hard to tell what, you know, you have to read somebody's comment or edit really really carefully in order to figure out what their actual um, edit is about. Um, they have had some success with this. Um, they have so far, um, let me see if I can find my actual note about it. Um, they've had, so on the, their most successful example is about a civil rights for internet users bill. Um, and they had seven public hearings, um, 62 speakers from civil society participate, and they got 374 online contributions. And some of those were actually, um, became part of the actual law. Um, one of the things that they found was that it's really for them to get actual citizens to, you know, for that information that citizens provide to be used, you have to have MPs who are really actually willing to use it. Um, not to mention staff as well. So my, this is my fourth? Yeah, this is my fourth and final example. So this is called Legislation Lab, and it's um, developed by our developer for Noava, who is Moroccan. Um, and this tool is being used in a couple different places at the moment. Um, in New York, they're using it in Kurdistan um, and in uh, Chile. Um, and it's a, here you can sort of get an idea of, of what it does. Basically, they provide a um, similar setup to uh, to the wiki ledges. Um, you can see the law on the left hand side. Here's your principles. Um, you can suggest your own edits and you can comment um, below. And then you can also vote, um, both up and down on the actual, on each individual um, part of the law. Um, here's an example of, so they provide all of their statistics in real time. Um, so this is an example from the Chilean um, version. Um, and they show you this graph of the votes both for and against for each law, um, which can help to basically uh, demonstrate which laws, which parts of the law are, you know, in the upper left hand, that means like, if it's dark green, that means like it only pretty much has favorable um, and very few unfavorable um, uh, votes. Um, bottom right is obviously only unfavorable, and left is a, the blue is a mix. Um, so it helps people, it helps you know lawmakers understand or any or users, civil society for example, um, to understand what um, you know what parts of the law are are, are most uh, less least controversial and most controversial, etc. Um, you can also see that they got 166 comments and then 44 edits. Um, we're hoping we're going to use this platform in Morocco for a discussion, hopefully, on um, the criminal code, which is a pretty big deal right now. So, keys to success. The first, you know, and foremost, in my opinion, is, you know, the UK government hired a behavioral scientist team, um, and they found that they could increase tax payments um, by telling people who are late on their taxes that their neighbors had already paid and that they were behind. Um, a very simple and subtle um, shift in what they were doing caused an increase in tax payments by 15%. Um, this is being used pretty widely now. Like in the US, if you look at your electricity bill, most likely um, they're telling you, um, you know, statistics about your neighborhood in order to get you to pay on time. Um, and I think this is an, uh, an example of how they incentivize, um, you know, people to pay taxes. And when we're talking about getting people to participate in online discussions, um, you really need to create some incentives. Um, I found that first, you know, the MPs, you have to find, you have to figure out why your MPs or your government would want to do this and why they should, why would, they would be interested in using the input that they're getting. Um, you have to think about what the staff, you know, who are going to be implementing it. Um, I'm talking about if this is being done by a government or a parliament, right? Um, you have to figure out where the staff think about it. And even if, if civil society or regular people are, are launching this, 
why is, why is anybody in government going to care that we're doing this? Um, and so you have to think about what, how can we make it easy for them to, to use this, and how is it going to benefit them? Um, and then for citizens, why are citizens going to participate in this? Um, for us, we often, you know, for us at the end of the day, if on our platform, you know, the question answer platform, if they're not going to get answers, then they're not going to ask questions. So for us, it's about supplying answers. And for the MPs, when we have like too many questions from citizens, they get really upset because they say we're inundating them with, you know, useless stuff. Um, so making sure that they can handle the workload that we're giving them is something that's crucial to getting them to respond. So figuring out what what makes people you know interested in these types of activities is really really important to getting them to succeed. Um, so I have a couple other keys that I wanted to discuss. First has to do with planning. Um, it's really important to define your objectives, figure out who your target audience is, how you're gonna, you know, what type of information you're gonna get them, how you're gonna respond, et cetera, et cetera. Um, oftentimes, you know, it's it's easy to do something online and to, and to not um, include certain communities that might not be in online. So it's important to be careful about things like that. Um, you have to choose your subject wisely. Um, abortion is not a good subject um, because that's going to get you a lot of those comments about I hate you, you know, this is horrible, you're a devil, and stuff like that. Um, but things that oftentimes, for example, that affect online um, users, for example, bills of rights for online engagement, you know, things like that, like anything that has to do with online, they, those tend to be get you know a community of people who are really interested in. So you have to figure out what community might be interested in the, in the work that you're doing. In Morocco, if we do the criminal code, we're really going to uh, focus on, on civil society um, because they have more of a, a stake in the game and law school students. Um, there's a lot of issues about sometimes about making sure that you know the stuff that goes on your platform is 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 um, uh, is helpful and is not you know uh, mean or anything like that. Um, on our website, we have adopted a code of conduct, which is helpful, um, and then we edit everything that goes up there. So if there is something, you know, if somebody is calling all the members of parliament, um, people know people who steal everything, um, then we won't put it up. Um, and that's already justified from our code of conduct. Um, there's some technical um, solutions to that as well. Uh, there's a French website that has, you know, every time you comment, uh, when you look at the comments, there's a button next to each comment that says report this comment. And they found that they have very few reported comments and very few, you know, bad comments as well. Um, providing quality background information. Um, a lot of citizens, you know, aren't extremely familiar with, with the topics that could be discussed. So making sure that you know everybody starting from a common a common basis can really help focus the comments and the edits um, and make sure people have a, a decent understanding um, before they start um, participating. Um, adopting flexible response policies. Um, a number of these events don't aren't just about sort of online commenting, even though they have events in public or they have events online and different ways of getting people to, to engage. Um, so thinking about how to mix that up um, so you get different communities involved um, is, is helpful. Um, partnering. Um, um, most governments don't often immediately think about partnering with civil society, um, but there's a lot of civil society organizations in this world that are interested in partnering with, with government and parliaments and et cetera um, to help them on these types of initiatives especially with the more, you know, challenging parts like, you know, developing, uh, you know, uh, developing reports about, you know, to help to summarize the activity, um, things that happened online, making sure that the reporting um, is effective. Um, like I said, providing quality analysis and feedback. Um, that's, a, that's a place where there's a number of universities that will, um, and programs and civil society organizations that will help but that's really important to making sure that citizens understand that you know they're going to their voices will actually be heard. And finally, being transparent about the, you know throughout the process, um, the process needs to be clear um, from all sides so that people understand what they're getting into, um, and that will help um, ensure that people participate. Better.
So thank you very much. I hope this is helpful. And uh, I look forward to any questions and talk after. Thanks.所以在你程度就是說教育而不是說真的是參與的一種形式。Thanks for the question. It's, it's important. Um, I think, you know, it depends on what subject you're going for and what type of resources you have. Um, you know, uh, governments and parliaments aren't always effective in providing, you know, quality, um, summarized, uh, you know, documents that help citizens understand what the actual um, laws that they're drafting are getting at. Um, so, doing what you can to help people understand that is really important. And that's one of the more challenging parts of this because oftentimes, you know, it's it's easy to say, here, I'm going to put this law up. Everybody give me your comments or your edits. Um, but it's it's really to do a, you know, to get quality feedback, you need to have, you need people to understand what they're actually editing. Um, so it depends on the subject. Let me give you an example. Um, there's a well-known, um, uh, uh, legislative, you know, op open uh, crowdsourced legislative drafting process from Finland, where the law that they were discussing was off-roading, um, using off-road uh, vehicles in like the northern part of Finland. Um, and uh, Finland's a small place, it's mostly rural, um, and it's cold, and a lot of people use off-road vehicles. Um, and a lot of people are affected by off-road vehicles as well. So you have people who live near um, main trails for off-road vehicles. You have people who have people, other people off-roading in their backyards and things like that. So it means something to people when you discuss this bill because although it sounds like something that's kind of silly and not that important, it's something that affects people's everyday lives. Um, so you know, coming to so so that's going to need a different type of, of background. You know, than something like that's really technical, like what the UK government was doing. Um, but helping people understand what the issues are, you know, helping you know, in in basic layman's terms, um, is important for any sort of discussion we want to have. So. So they're actually blocking people from having discussions about legislation online? Right. Cool. 
Well, <laughs> in a lot of places, it's interesting because in a lot of places that I know that are even, uh, so what authoritarian governments that I'm more familiar with do, like in Morocco, uh, uh, in, well, and, and also new democracies or, or, or uh, not very well institutionalized democracies like in, in some places in uh, Southern Africa, Zimbabwe, for example, they, um, um, they have online commenting, but it's just really bad. Um, so they basically will put up a law and say, hey, send us you know, an email. And then you never know what happens to your email, if anybody reads it or not. Um, I don't know, of, um, I've never had an experience, or I, I don't know of experiences where they've actually prevented citizens from discussing a law online. Um, um, so I'm afraid I don't have a really good answer. I would, I mean, I, I, my, what I would do would be to show them a couple of examples. Um, and it, I can imagine it would be tricky depending on what the law is. If it's a constitution, for example, um, something like that, that's where maybe they don't want citizen input and they just want to have elite discussions. I can see that. Um, maybe one idea would be to start with something simpler, start with something less um, scary for them. Um, also showing them um, examples from different places where, you know, particularly from governments where they're using this as a tool. Um, you know, there's governments everywhere that are doing this and not taking the input. Um, but it can still lead to, like, you know, effective dialogue. So, like, there's one example from the U.S. where um, uh, Obama's petition website um, got a petition, somebody wrote a petition and got 100,000 signatures asking the U.S. government to create a Death Star. Um, and so they, uh, um, they had a fantastic response, which was basically like, why would we create a Death Star? Because that got blown up in episode three. But, um, but they got um, in the response, uh, and you know, they sent a blast email to all the 100,000 people who, who, um, who signed. And they said, well, if you're interested, here's what NASA is doing on these different things. And they got like millions of, or not millions, but they got a lot of subscribers to like NASA's um, email lists or, um, and things like that where people weren't engaged before. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. I have an actual question about uh, how do we actually use these kinds of participation models to attract people who come from an older generation that are not so used to using these kinds of platforms? Especially, I'm from Canada, where I'm from, uh, people that are over 65 don't have that kind of, um, uh, don't have that kind of ability to even use the internet to kind of use these kind of participation models. Even if they could use those participation models, they have a feeling that this is something to be suspicious about. So my, my first question would be, how do we track these kinds of people? What kind of strategies can we use? And then two, how do we allay their kind of suspicions of these kinds of platforms? Um, so I'll give you an example of what we're doing in Morocco. Um, Morocco is a country of about 37 million people. And um, that's unofficial. Official, it's 33. But we know it's a lot more. Um, and uh, and uh, we have almost 40% of the country is illiterate. Um, and there's a good percentage of people who don't speak written languages. Um, so Amazigh languages are, are, are spoken, but not written. Um, and then, you know, so we have a lot of challenges. Um, that said, we have, the reason we did our platform for, you know, MP engagement is that um, there's a number of, there's a lot of people online, especially you, on Facebook. And um, I think there's about 9 million on Facebook, at, at least. So that's a good, significant percentage of the country. Um, but for us, you know, there's still a lot of people who are in rural areas who don't have access, illiterate, and so. So we we face that challenge. And one of the things that we've done recently is we um, created a program of ambassadors. So we train ten kids from different regions of the country um, who are all pretty internet savvy, um, and we had them, you know, we just trained them for two days. We gave them cell phones and said, like, go around and take videos of people, you know, who have questions for their MPs and send them to us. Um, and so that's what they're doing now. Um, and they're all going to host uh, a local event to help people better understand the project. 
Um, the first one is actually this weekend, and it's in Tata, which is like, it's basically the Sahara Desert. Um, and, and so that's one of the things that we're doing. So I think, you know, the UK government, they were doing their offline um, engagement, you know, events. Um, I know for the Iceland, they did when they um, crowdsourced their constitution. Um, they had massive events where they tried to get a range of people to come and participate. So at times, you know, it might have to be offline participation. Um, and when you go to people and explain to them what you're doing, I mean, it can, you know, just seeing a face can can help with that process. I mean, nobody in Morocco thinks that an MP is going to answer their question. I assure you that. Like, we've had, when we told people we were going to do this, they were like, good luck. <laughs> um, and it's a challenge. I mean, we, you know, we have 38 MPs out of 400 who are participated. And, but we've had about uh, 120 questions answered out of 200. So about 65% response rate. So um, I think the offline part, of you can't, you know, if you want to engage a, a wide group of people, you can't deny the offline part. Like, it, you need to have roots um, somewhere in reality, offline reality. Thank you for being the one who are with us today. <laughs> Do we have more questions on all this? Uh, hi, thank you for your speech. And uh, you said about uh, some controversial issue like abortion. You said it's not uh, a proper or good to talk online. And I wonder, uh, because some some laws we think it's protected for some minor groups, like uh, for some LGBT people, uh, marriage equality is a very important issue. So do you think um, there is no way or there is some limitation about those online discussion? Um, so when I said, Abortion, I was just using an example of an issue that, like, um, well, yeah, it's it's something that gets everybody riled up, um, and it's not really a very, it's not like a technical problem that you're trying to solve. Um, it's sort of like abortion is legal or illegal. Um, and that kind of discussion ends up, you know, it's just not, it, for that reason, um, it's not the type of discussion that is most effective to have an online discussion about. Um, so it's not just, so I guess, you know, if we're talking about LGBT, I would ask what would be the goal of the discussion? You know, if it's, if there's technical issues in the law um, that, um, that maybe, you know, that could be one thing. Um, but if, you know, depending really on what you're going for, I would say it may or may not be the right type of law for this type of discussion. Or, um, if you still want to do it online, then I would, I would um, consider different ways of allowing people to comment or edit. So for example, um, you may or may not decide that um, Facebook, that having, you know, enabling commenting through Facebook is a good thing. Um, on social media, on YouTube for example, you know, like, you can't even read YouTube comments because usually like 95% of the time they're awful. Um, no matter what your subject is. So, you know, thinking about what types of comments, you know, how you want the commenting process to function, um, whether it should have editing first, or, or, or moderation first, um, before it's uploaded, or whether, um, you know, you want to have moderation <laughs> after. Um, you know, those are all decisions that you can make to help sort of determine, um, you know, how your discussion will go. Um, but I still think, you know, generally speaking, when you, you know, you have to really figure out what type of audience you're trying to to reach, um, who's going to be interested in your subject, um, and then what type, what your real goal is um, in having the discussion online, um, and that will help you sort of determine um, the best way to go about doing it. Oh, we'll have another two hundred wait. Thank you.